Okay, good. So I'm here with Friedman Fly, and he just turned on recording. So I'm going to do a proper introduction. But since you went ahead and responded to that kind of deep personal question, which I thought was really cool, can I recap where we were at? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, Freeman and I were just talking that, you know, I hadn't really known a lot about his, his work, you know, what he's published, which is amazing, and anyone can go check out. But in particular, I, I especially didn't even know about his background. And I was telling Freeman that, you know, I had just done this interview with the famous UFO guy, Whitley Strieber, who I think is amazing. And one thing I found out about Whitley in that interview was that Whitley didn't know it, but at the time he was kind of getting into some of this very early, uh, he was in MK Ultra. He was, his dad put him in an MK Ultra program when he was nine years old. And this is scary as shit. And it totally affected Whitley's life forever. And like his neighbor friend who, who also went to the program where these kids were like locked in these Faraday cages and tortured. I mean, this is true MK Ultra shit. And he said, you know, the kid across the street from me, he never recovered. He was like locked in his house until he was like 50 years old, you know, it just barely, you know, is this reduced to kind of, as we hear with so many people who are traumatized with that mind control stuff. And this, this folks is, is Whitley Strieber, who we all know. So anyways, back to Freeman here. I'm talking to Freeman that, you know, I didn't know much about his, I didn't know anything about his background. And then I'm reading or I'm listening to this really good interview he did on Knox Menta. And lo and behold, Freeman reveals that from a very young age, he's this gifted kid. He's this spaceman, which I thought was incredible. You know, <laughs> what do you want to be? Spaceman. Oh, you want to be an astronaut? That's really good, kid. No, I want to be a spaceman. I love that. <laughs> but anyways, you're super interested in everything, UFO, space, all this. And then later in life, your dad says, oh, yeah, uh, by the way, I used to chase UFOs for Alan Hynek as part of the Blue Book project. Yes. I mean, Project Blue Book. So I, I, I've gone on and on, but that'll be a good introduction for folks on Skeptico can that's an amazing amazing story for where you're coming at this stuff what else can you fill in about that oh man you know it was crazy because uh, it was uh, when I went to college right and uh, well you know thinking of Whitley Strieber and his uh, experience I didn't really have an MK Ultra experience but I was always put into special courses in school and when I asked my mom about that she had no knowledge of it whatsoever. They used to stick me in this room with just a few other kids and they, we were the specials, whatever. And this is elementary school. And they would set me in this room with just uh, catalogs of note cards. And there were just thousands of them and we were to read them and then take quizzes on them. And I did this for, you know, I don't even know how long. Uh, and I'm certain that so much data got put in my brain through that. I really even believe that I learned Friday the 13th was uh, due to the Knights Templar back then. Like, I don't know what they programmed in me, right? Like, there was just so many note cards, so many facts, and then you just take it all in and take the test. Hold know? up, hold up. Freeman, what the hell? I mean, I have never heard. It, 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 you know, so now you're a grown-ass man. You've never heard of that being. <laughs> being uh, you know a, a, a standard any kind of method ever used in school what do you think was going on there yeah i don't know and, and when i asked mom she's like oh, i don't know anything about that and I, now, are you sure are you sure of that because one thing i really liked when i interviewed whitley he said you know I, I i came out of that thing and my head was so scrambled that i wasn't even sure it really happened and he said, I had to go and tra trace down other people who were with me at the time and say, do you remember when we were nine years old and we went through this thing? And that confirmation for him was like life changing because it was like, OK, I'm not totally whacked out. I mean, did you ever wonder if that was like real or like a dream or like, how could that be? I mean, it just doesn't fit. 
Yeah, I have. And, you know, that's what brought it up with my mom. And I, yeah, I would love to figure out who was in there with me. And I don't even remember uh, and, and get confirmation of that as well. And uh, somebody else's experience and whether or not they remember it. I mean, we had one time like this is just an example of memory of um, me and my nephew walking down the beach in Florida near a submarine base and suddenly night turned to day. And I'm looking around like it's daylight and I turn around just in time to see that glow disappear into the submarine base. And I'm like, wow, that was crazy. What was that? You know, and this was you know, 30 years ago. And so later I asked my nephew, you know, do you remember when night turned to day? He had no recollection of it whatsoever. Like, how can you not remember that? That was, you know, the most bizarre instance other than seeing giant flying rectangles and flying Vs because that's my life. But uh, yeah, uh, but then back to dad and, and that whole scenario, you know, I, I learned about my mom's history. Oh, my God. You know, I had no idea. Uh, she was married to like the grand potentate of Kaiser Slot and Masonry was a billionaire. And then my dad stole her from the worshipful master, which then made him have to leave Freemasonry because you can't steal another worshipful master's wife. Um, and mom's story, she was raised by a witch that was renowned healer that she would do spells and remove warts from cattle and stuff. I don't know. And so that was like mom's side of the story of running from the Nazis because she grew up in, in Germany and uh, had to be fled off to uh this witch in france you know and that was mom's story from uh raised by a witch and then given to the billionaire head of freemasonry and kaiser Slotten, and then uh marries my dad uh dad's history is a complete mystery to me whatsoever he never really spoke at all uh and then then i find out well, then let's see. So then I learn of Freemasonry, esotericism, all of the magic and the occult. While I'm in college, I meet a guy who's heavily into Aleister Crowley. Now, this is 1991, right? So nobody knew any of this stuff. Like we were like, what's esoteric, you know? And he, <laughs> he's like, well, it means you don't know what it means. And so we're like, oh, all right, sure. Whatever, dude, you know? So anyway, but he's looking at all these, showing us these pictures from McCrowley books and from Mason books and stuff. And suddenly I recognize the symbols that I'm seeing. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I recognize this stuff. It's in my dad's top drawer. And he's like, well, your dad's a Freemason. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, you're talking about all this crazy magic stuff. And I'm like, no, not my dad. No. And so I go home and I ask, <laughs> I'm like, hey, dad, well, you know, what's up? I just learned about this Freemasonry thing. Uh, and that's when he lays it on me. Well, yeah, yeah, of course. I was worshipful master. Da, da, da. Uh, I don't even remember what he said about that, because then he dropped the bomb about, well, I used to chase flying saucers from Blue Book, you know. And I'm like, well, wait, 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 flying saucers are real? And he's like, yeah, flying saucers are real. Uh, you know, I was I was stationed on a on a South Sea base with uh, four radar dishes, and it was my job to report whenever the flying saucers came over. And I'm like, my whole life I've known this. I mean, my whole life I've been looking at this, and you never told me a thing. And he just never said anything more about it. So, uh, 93, I have a massive UFO experience, me and a friend down on Daytona beach, this giant flying rectangles hovering out over the ocean. And we're just pointing at it like dumbfounded, can't say a word. And then I, re I don't remember it leaving, but I remember my finger moving when it followed the, the craft or whatever this thing was. It was like a giant window in space. I couldn't even, you know, it had, it was a rectangle, you know, like it doesn't fly. I don't know. It didn't make any sense. Right. Uh, it wasn't metallic or anything. It was a giant red, uh, glowing rectangle. And so we witnessed this thing. We're sitting there looking at it. We're sitting on a lifeguard stand. It's, it's spring break. There's tens of thousands of people behind us on the strip of Daytona. You know, it's just massive party, right? But we didn't, we weren't ready to go there. It was about 10 p.m. We weren't ready to join in. We wanted to go to the beach first and then 
you know, go join in the festivities, but it was 10 o'clock at night on the beach. And then this giant rectangles hovering over the ocean and we're pointing at it. And then I, I see my finger, follow it away. We jump down like, Oh my God, what was that? And we want to go tell everyone that we could possibly see. So this is two years after I, I so I learned of dad in college in 91 when I started. And then in 93, when I graduated, this is what happened. Um, so we're, we run over to the strip. We're ready to just tell anyone and everyone, oh my God, you won't believe what we just saw. We get to the strip, which is only a block away from where we were. Uh, and it's empty. It's completely empty. There's no one. Like, where'd they all go? We thought we were in a twilight zone. We're freaking out, like walking down the middle of the strip in Daytona, no cars, no people, no nothing. What happened? We thought we were the last people on the planet. Everybody had been abducted or we'd been moved into another dimension. Who knows? It's just everybody was gone. So we walk and we walk and, and suddenly we see a group of people and we're like, hey, man, you know, what time is it? And it was uh, like 2.30, 3, it was like 3.30 in the morning. Everybody had gone home. So we had lost from 10 till 3, uh, just gone. And then I didn't remember this. And then this is also very strange. The person that was with me, uh, he's ended up living in every state that I've lived in. And I, I, he lived in Texas when I lived in Texas, lived in Kansas when I lived in Kansas. He lives in South Carolina now. Mm. And we don't talk. We, no. we haven't. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, it's just one day in Kansas, I ran into him, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, hey. And so I brought him home and was like, hey, you know, just introducing him. And he told the story to everyone, which is always nice when you want to confirm a UFO story to people when somebody else brings it up and tells the story. So, um, but so this guy, um, but, but how does he process the five missing hours? He claims he doesn't remember much. Yeah. Yeah. And when he, when I questioned him on it, he said, well, do you remember seeing future Orlando? And this, I didn't, but I kind of do like, I kind of think I remember, but I'm not sure. But what was weird is after that event, I had always said that I was shown the future because I started predicting world events right after that. Uh, like as if we were shown the apocalypse or something, because from that moment, I, you know, I predicted 9-11. I predicted W would be forced into office. I pre predicted Barack Obama wouldn't have a birth certificate. I predicted, you know, just over and over and over again. I mean, 9-11 was the big one. That, that one freaked everybody out. They're like, how'd you know? How'd you know? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not sure. I just put the pieces together. You know, it just seemed right. Because, uh, you, you, you know, the reason I was kind of poking uh, at that, I mean, this is like, at this point, so standard in the UFO contact experience when there's two people. And, you know, like sometimes there'll be even, I don't know if you experience this with your friend, but when it does come back for people, there's almost kind of some resentment like, hey, why didn't you help me, you know, or, or, or what happened, you know, or this kind of denial, don't ever bring that up. It's interfering with my life kind of thing. So it is cool that you're able to get your friend to confirm it, but you guys didn't feel a need to kind of explore that or explore. I mean, did, did it really, did it really interfere with your life in terms of, you know, figuring out what that, what that meant? Uh, not, not as much because I was already a free being. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, uh, cause you were like a surfer and, uh, right. Is, is I was a total beach bum. Yeah. And then I ended up into a van person. So the moment I graduated college, I just got in a van and I left and I traveled the country for the next decade. Yeah. Yeah. But and, and you, was, you're out there in Daytona where they all those freaking sharks. I don't know how you guys surf out there. Yeah. At least here in, in California, we don't have sharks. So once every 20 years, you guys, man, it's like, aren't you fighting them off every time you go out in the water? Do you still go out in the water? No, I, uh, I actually quit surfing uh, Hurricane David when uh, I caught my first nine foot wave and did not know what to do and fell off of it. 
I didn't, mm. it never occurred to me that you could fall off the wave. Like, and, you know, the, the waves in Florida are like four feet high, you know, tops. And this, uh, I decided to go surfing during Hurricane David. And I got on this wave and it just kept going up and up and up and up. And I'd never experienced an actual curl or an actual wave. And so I didn't know what to do. And I literally fell off the face of it. And so I'm like falling through the air, like, oh, my God, what just happened? And then I hit the bottom of the ocean and then the wave came down on top of me. It cracked my surfboard in half, cashed my leg open, pummeled me across the bottom of the ocean floor for a while. And finally, I rose up and I never surfed again. <laughs> you know, that's standard stuff out here. And I am not a surfer. I mean, if ever, anyone ever sees me on a surfboard, they would confirm that. But, you know, both of my boys were, were and are, you know, surfers. And yeah, I mean, that's like that standard stuff yeah. out here, you know, getting in the washing machine and how long could you hold your breath and all that stuff. But. Yeah. I never was that much of a surfer. I just happened to have my, my nephews hand me down surfboards. So I did it, you know, on occasion, but yeah, there were three of us living in a Camaro with a surfboard. So you would actually fight to sleep in the driver's seat. Uh, <laughs> it was actually the most comfortable spot, <laughs> believe it or not, in, in a Camaro. Yeah. Uh, for three right. people living in it with a surfboard, you know, it was. Uh... <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, to, to add the final bit to this puzzle. So in 2004, I was given the Access television show. I started the Freeman Perspective. You know, this is before YouTube and Google and all that. And uh, I'm actually in the studio right after Alex Jones. So that was kind of exciting. I got to see Alex every week. Uh, but um, he, uh, I, I scheduled my dad as my first whistleblower uh, wow. interview. Wow, great. Well, yeah, it would have been, except for he died that day. Uh, wow. Very strange. No one expected it. Was not anticipated. Didn't know. Uh, he simply did not wake up on the day that he was supposed to do the interview. Now, I was in Texas and was going to fly to Florida that day to interview my dad. And he, I got word, you know, don't come. And uh, so that was rather shocking. And once I looked into my dad's history a little more, now if there was ever a potential MK Ultra or abuse victim, you know, it was him. And all of the weird stuff. I mean, he was on Killer One with Jimmy Carter, the first killer submarine. Uh, oh. Jimmy wrote my dad when he became president. Uh, you know, there were a lot of weird, weird connections that were in dad's. I've got some of the weirdest Masonic documents from like Iceland and stuff for him. I have his uh, Supreme Council, you know, the 33rd degree stuff. Uh, and, and you have just also in your personal history going to North Dakota, working on the nukes, mm -hmm, coming mm -hmm. back and working on the nukes again, not you, but your dad. And again, you know, one of the things I thought was interesting about that, and I really want to get into this if you're comfortable with it, is because it's something we all go through, you know, we become adults and we unpack all that stuff. And we see it differently because we are actually able to walk in your in that person's shoes, you know. And I can just imagine, you know, you going through that of your dad being told he's got to go to North Dakota. You know, what is that all about after everything he's done? And, you know, the, your dad's relationship with his with your mom, you know, and that whole thing. I mean, as you start putting those pieces together. How do you, how does that, you know, where does that take you? Just leaves me confused. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, what, what, what I've found really intriguing is while I've done this and brought these things to light uh, is that those that are really interested in what I'm saying, find out that their family's involved. So one day we're at Thanksgiving dinner at my roommate's house and I, just interviewed uh, Tex Mars on uh, hand signs and gestures of the Illuminati. And uh, 
so I brought it up at Thanksgiving dinner, which, you know, wouldn't be something normally I would do, but I had just finished the interview and I was excited. Well, lo and behold, I opened a can of worms. Uh, it turns out my friend's dad was all involved in chasing flying saucers and project, uh, shoot, I can't remember, star something. Either way, all of a sudden his dad just starts going off at Thanksgiving dinner and I totally destroyed Thanksgiving dinner because and and my my roommate did had no idea that his dad was into all of this stuff. And but I opened the door and his dad just started blurting it all out, brought us back into his secret lab where he had all of the data and stuff. And like my friend had no idea. So uh it it's really it, like it it's to me speaks heavily of genetic memory yeah yeah well in, in yeah well on a couple of different levels right i mean one is the kind of literally genetic bloodline alien kind of stuff but the other is just kind of kind of a genetic memory in in a in a not a literal sense but just kind of you're in that soup and i think sometimes as kids you're picking up little bits and pieces of conversations but also just picking up energy and feeling and emotions and stuff that you know you're somehow processing again relating it back to to whitley you know he doesn't know his dad is in you know, military intelligence. His mom is in military intelligence too, kind of same as yours. And, you know, the other interesting thing I was just going to throw out there, just kind of random thoughts, but that's okay. If you ever look into, anyone ever looks into uh, Ted Kaczynski, and a lot of people have kind of reported on this, it's not like I'm breaking anything here. But again, you know, and he's the Unabomber, right? And you John Connor. Story. What's that? John Connor. Who's, the, who's John Connor? John Connor was the uh, the time traveler that tried to destroy uh, Skynet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but uh, so not so. Let me go a different place. Sorry, uh, Ted Kaczynski. He's a freshman at Harvard. Do you remember this part of his his biography? This is like true. This is like documented. He's he goes into this class, and uh, he just starts as a freshman. I don't care if you're at Harvard or if you're at Savannah State. I mean, a freshman in college, you're like your most vulnerable time in your life. You know, you've left home and stuff like that. Suddenly, Kaczynski is in the middle of this experiment. The whole class is an experiment of whether you can fucking destroy somebody. I mean, so they just start, they just start kind of ripping him up really, really bad and telling him, you know, how stupid he is and, you know, how he's just, just totally destroy the kid. And he goes back and everyone in his family says he's a changed person after this. And this isn't like, you know, they put uh, electrodes on his head or anything. They did it just with social conditioning. But the fricked professor who needs to be, you know, kind of hung by his thumbs or worse, was working for MK Ultra. It was just a little side project, like, oh, you know, along with all the other shit we're doing, let's see if we can just take young impressionable kids and just kind of crush them socially and what effect that will have. And we don't have to draw a straight line and say that's why the guy became the Unabomber. That's not my point. My point is, you know, when we all try and put together, and I don't have that history, I really don't. I can't, I can't front say that i wouldn't want to you know i'm glad i don't have that history right. but when we try and relate to like your story i think we got to be a lot more open to all the crazy shit that went on and all the different ways they they did this shit. do you have any any thoughts on that and 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 how it might relate to, because again, I can't get past this thing of the school and the cards and the, is, is, was this in uh, North Carolina or South Carolina or? No, in Florida. It? In Florida. It's close to a military base. Oh yeah. I was born on a military base. Dude. I don't know. I mean, that just sounds so freaking strange. Yeah. We had the uh, nuclear naval base right there. Uh, so every Friday we got to listen to the cannons go off for their 
ceremony. Because you know, you you said genetic, you know. So if, if genetic programming, so if we just treat that metaphorically, you know, so your dad has gone through this shit. How open is he when someone goes and says, Hey, you know, we got this kind of thing, and you know, it isn't gonna hurt your kid, but you know, let's see what happens. We'll put him in this room and see if he can record, if we can record all this shit into his brain. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, as far as I know, dad wasn't involved in my life at all, but who knows? Like he was a non-factor. He never spoke. Uh, I, I finally, you know, just gave him this sort of acceptance to say that his entire life was top secret. So what did he have to talk about? You know, other than his war stories. Uh, <clears throat> but and speaking, it's interesting that you say that he never talked too, right? Yeah. Because then what is your experience, you know, growing up and in uh, grammar school and stuff? Like, didn't you say you like hardly ever spoke unless, you know. That's true. I didn't speak either. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't speak until the seventh grade. Like, I mean, not that I was mute or anything, but in school, yeah, I never said a word. No, we all know that kid. We all know that kid who's just like, you know, trying to be invisible, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it wasn't like, you know, a conscious thing. I just was super shy. Uh, you know, I would pee in my pants before I could get up the courage to ask to go to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, it's crazy shit. Just crazy. <laughs> no, but you know what? I don't want to say that because then that dismisses the whole thing. I think what we're trying to do, what you're trying to do on your show is kind of just continue to poke around at all these things and just see what falls out. So I'm glad we went down this whole thing because... Until you start, and, and particularly until you start comparing those experiences with other people's experiences, I mean, we can't even begin to get a handle on that. Isn't isn't that what, I mean, I've listened to some of your interviews. I'm going to listen to your, your interview with Kathy O'Brien, and you're mm. like, you, you can hold space for Kathy O'Brien, even though you didn't go through that kind of, you know, sexual abuse and manipulation and satanic crazy crap but you can hold space in a way because of the experience you went through and it sounds different on your show than it does on other people's shows absolutely and you know i consider kathy a close friend now which is amazing to me and right after kathy left mary sean young stopped by so I was feeling pretty king of the castle at that point because uh, she's also a good friend. And I had just finished speaking with Sean Stone and, and Mary Sean Young had held Sean Stone as a baby. She's like, yeah, it was like holding a bag of bowling balls uh, in Wall Street, the movie. So I had the, all this cross connection going on because I had just talked with Sean Stone and Kathy O'Brien and then Mary Sean Young shows up at my house, you know, and I'm like, well, this is just too much. I can't believe where I'm at in life right now uh this is but yeah i mean i was the one who unveiled the idea of high profile rituals and then the internet just took it right like it, i was the first person to come on television and slap satan in the face and say here is some live real time mk ultra uh going on right now and that was my report on anna nicole Brittany, and mind control and I had studied mind control, MK Ultra, and all of these techniques so deeply that I was traumatized. So I was freaking out. I even asked Red Ice to remove the second half of my interview because I scared myself so much with what I had revealed. And no one had talked about high profile rituals in Hollywood and, and politics until me. And I brought that to the surface along with the corporate logos and the secret signs. And then that just exploded across the web and no one, no one realized that it was me that started that whole conversation. Like I was quickly forgotten uh, that it was me that taught David Icke about Illuminati corporate logos. And it was me that taught the world about the high profile rituals because mine started with Y2K. Uh, and I've been talking about that since then. I mean, 
And that was the hey, moment. Hey, tell, tell me then that's, that's freaking amazing. That's amazing. And I, I'm, I feel really sure without, I haven't looked into that, but I just have a gut sense that you're totally right. And especially David Icke. I love David Icke, but all his, virtually all his, I mean, he has a direct experience, which matters, you know, but I, I, he borrows a lot of stuff and that's okay. You know, it's like stealing jokes. I don't think that's particularly bad, you know, but right. you should reference people a little right. bit, but anyways, tell me why 2k. I don't remember the significance of that in terms of a symbol or a sign. Yeah. See, that was when it all began for me to click because, um, uh, Let's see. So I was working and going to Kansas University at this point, uh, 1999. I was um, I was actually the Pizza Hut guy at Kansas University, and I was feeding the lawyers and the engineers. And so I would bring in all this documentation and stuff, you know, like harp and stuff. And they would be like, oh, they can just say whatever they want on the Internet. And, you know, then Y2K started coming around and I was bringing them documents from FEMA and the DOD that said prepare for three days. And everybody's like, oh, you know, man, you can't believe what you read on the Internet. And I'm like, it says .gov. This is your government telling you to prepare for three days. I, you know, oh, you, you just go back to your bunker, you know, as if I was panicking. I'm not panicking. I'm just letting you know that uh, this is your government telling you to prepare. Uh, I honestly don't believe in the Y2K meltdown. It wouldn't make any sense. They've known about this since 1974. You know, it's like if it does happen, it was planned. So, um, you know, that was when when the Y2K ritual happened, I actually quit the world at that moment. So since 1999 till 2021, I have not had a legitimate job. I quit the world altogether when I realized that nothing was real. <laughs> nothing was as we thought. So for Y2K, they did a massive glory ritual to Lucifer across the entire planet. So it started with this little island, uh, I think, again, in the South Seas, I'm not sure, but the island adopted uh, daylight savings time uh, so that they could be the first one to hit Y2K. And they had them in their straw grass skirts and stuff all doing a hula dance or whatever. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Uh, and then that ritual moved over. So, for examples, uh, the ones that come to mind right away, well, the igniting of the phallus in Paris, the, the Eiffel Tower, Masonic uh, construction. Uh, then they built the Millennial Dome there in London next to Big Ben, which uh, complemented the male-female phallus. Uh, symbolism meanwhile also inserting the eye the giant ferris wheel uh, and then they burnt the river St uh, thames to the speed of the sun uh, with fireworks so that was like the river sticks and then uh, it came over to america and bill clinton was standing there saying our children are ready uh, it is a rising sun and then they made a light so bright behind, uh, I think it was the Lincoln Memorial. I'm not exactly sure, but they made a light so bright, like I was witnessing in, in, at the beach with, with my nephew, uh, that it lit up as if the sun was rising in the West. And then these were all symbols of Horus. Oh, well, of course I left out. The most important was the, the rumors that the Grateful Dead would be playing at the, the pyramids and stuff or Pink Floyd. I don't remember. I think they would say in the Grateful Dead. But either way, I knew that all, all of that was wrong, that Jean-Michael Jarre was going to be playing the 12 Dreams of the Sun, which again goes back to the solar symbolism. And then they had Anubis, uh, a multitude of Anubi, standing there in black men in black suits holding torches uh as they announced the new year and they had all of the symbolism of horus going across the pyramids uh and they were supposed to cap the great pyramid with gold so when people were talking to me about y2k then the lock or the potential of you know the computer meltdown i would say but no they're capping the great pyramid with gold uh and they were like, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, dude, I know, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's the completion of the, the New World Order. You know, they're going to cap the Great Pyramid. Well, I don't get it. You know, nobody was onto this stuff yet. And uh, then the weirdest thing happens, and I followed this through Enterprise Mission with Richard Hoagland as he was covering it live. Now, back in 99, 
you had to just read stuff <laughs> you know right, what i mean right. like and and so i'm reading all of this stuff as it's happening and um hey quick pause before you get into hoagland because i want you to remind people who hoagland is because he's kind of fallen off the the radar but he was a super important guy back there and the other thing that I wanted to clarify, so Freeman, are you kind of saying that the computer meltdown, your ATM card won't work, was kind of a head fake to kind of distract? Or is that what you're saying? Or, or what? Yeah, honestly, at the time, I didn't have enough uh, knowledge to really sort out why they would put such a thing out. I wasn't thinking of such things at that time but i uh, had already done enough research on it to know that this was something they had known about for 20 years and that i just knew there was no way that they would let the credit system and the money system fall uh and oh well you know what it did do was that they they charged ten dollars per line to repair it so if you take just the department of defense just a portion of the Department of Defense had uh, 500 million lines of code just for one department inside of the Department of Defense. That was one that I had followed. Uh, 500 million lines of code at $10 a line. You know, they made billions <laughs> off of Y2K. Okay. I mean, that's pretty right. I'm, I'm always a little bit leery of the, th there's always a financial play in there. But what about from that kind of higher social engineering kind of thing? again is i'm just asking i don't know i don't I have no opinion this is like i know half the story but you're adding so much to it is it is it kind of a head fake get everyone thinking it's one thing so there's less attention paid to what we're really doing kind of thing or i know, guess that would be breathing. my thought now yeah yeah everyone's breathing a sigh of release Whew, everything didn't crash so you're no you're just kind of numb to the fact of what's really going on from a ritual basis right yeah, 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 that that was that was my later thought. Uh, but yeah, at the time, I didn't have enough knowledge to really even try and understand that. OK, so uh, then so then Hoagland, what's the connection with Hoagland and remind people about. OK, Hoagland. so Richard Hoagland was the one who came out with the face on Mars, uh, Cydonia and the pyramids on Mars. Uh, mainstream guy, right? Mainstream. I think it was like on CBS you know, he'd be like the science guy on CBS News occasionally. If I got it wrong, it was like ABC. It was one of them. But and then he started doing this kind of stuff that was much more fringy, too. Right. Right. And this, I, I believe what I'm talking about now with Y2K predates all of that. If I remember correctly, it predates the Cydonia stuff because uh, he was he was investigating Harp quite a bit. And um but the, the story that caught me was on the capping of the Great Pyramid with gold. So there, there is a, if anyone can find it, if there's a hoarder out there somewhere, because USA Today is not databased. The, the newspaper USA Today has never been databased. Like you can't go and find microfish in the, in the library or anything ever. They never did. Right. They were just a newspaper that came out and you, you just they were not databased. Right. And it's a very Masonic newspaper, USA Today. So if you ever want the Mason perspective, then that's where you go. Um, so the headline for uh, Y2K, uh, well, actually, it was December 18th, 1999. So if you have a stack of USA Today somewhere from 1999 lying around, please look for this for me because I've been trying to find it ever since. I wish I'd just picked up a copy that day. I don't know why I didn't. Uh, I guess because I was a wage slave and I didn't feel like paying for a paper. But um, December 18th, 1999, you can't even find this online. Uh, the headline read, Muslims stop the Freemasons from capping the Great Pyramid with gold. That was the headline. December 18th, <laughs> 1999 on USA Today. No one noticed. Nobody cared. No one said anything about it. But what was curious with Richard Hoagland is he was tracking the, the same things. Me and him were on a lot of the same, you know, I just loved eating his stuff up. Like I just, anyway, uh, 
So there was Egyptian Flight 990, which was named Thothmosis, uh, which some have even believed Thothmosis was Moses and you know converted from Egypt. But anyway, uh, so Egyptian Flight 990 flew out of uh, New York. It went and landed in LaGuardia. Oh, wait, I got that backwards. Okay, so it, it starts from LaGuardia. Uh, it lands at... Uh, Patterson Air Force Base, and I have to keep all these these names straight. It picks up 33 Egyptian military there. Now, this is the first time a, a commercial airline had ever landed at any of these bases, and especially this and, one. And this we can we can find documentation on this. Yeah, Egyptian Flight 990. 990, and then the 33. That's right. So, right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 33 Egyptian military plus a uh, head of jet propulsion laboratories. Uh, uh -huh. So the, uh, we the got the Crowley. Crowley exactly. And the Parsons Enterprise. Exactly. And so then they fly from, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's Patterson. You, we can double check that. But of course it was a UFO, uh, you know, base. base. Right. Uh -huh. And, then so these 33 Egyptian military and the jet propulsion laboratory scientists fly off to LaGuardia to start their trip to the pyramids mm -hmm. uh, to Egypt. This is all, you know, right before Y2K and the the airplane Egyptian flight 990 suddenly takes a nosedive and the pilot seems to get control of it again and then it takes another nosedive. He calls out a Muslim prayer because he was an Egyptian pilot and the airplane crashes into the ocean. Everyone dies. Uh, so since this was pre-terrorist, they called it uh, pilot suicide because of the prayer that he called out. <laughs> and so then all of those people died and suddenly they announced Muslims stopped the Freemasons from capping the Great Pyramid with gold. Wow. And the capping never happened. They, of course, later said that the reason the capping, capping of the pyramid didn't happen was they were worried about the helicopter causing uh, destruction as they laid this giant gold capstone on top. Because you can find the story about them canceling the capital or the capping of the Great Pyramid, but you cannot find that USA Today headline that says Muslims stop the Freemasons from capping the Great Pyramid with gold. I've wanted that forever, ever. I God, I'm so mad at myself for not buying it. <laughs> you know, but. this is the kind of stuff like um, I always have to tell folks like you, you know, because sometimes I think you guys. I don't know. I shouldn't say this, but like I, I started my thing talking to scientists, and I still talk to a lot of scientists. You know, like Donald Hoffman. You know, he's a physicist at Caltech. You know, and he's got a really popular TED Talks, and he's kind of a frontier science guy. But he's a fucking physicist at Caltech. You know, right? And so I got hundreds of interviews with people like that, and they're awesome. Don Hoffman particularly is awesome because he has this spiritual side too, and he has this deeper understanding of consciousness. But that whole world that I started with, they are completely shut down on all this stuff. And the really hard part is because Lord knows I've tried, they don't have a path in. You know, like they've totally shut me. I shouldn't say totally because I still have a ton of friends in that community. But you talk Pizzagate, they're gone. They're gone. They're saying you're QAnon. I don't even know what I, I wouldn't even know where to begin what QAnon is. All I know is, you know, it's like if you talk to anyone who's really uh, uh, investigated uh, the abuse of kids and dissociative, dissociative identity disorder and MK Ultra as a part of, you know, again, back to Whitley Strieber. But then if you also look at it from a satanic ritual abuse, you know, documented cases where they've actually arrested people and put them in prison. The first thing they'll tell you about Pizzagate is, well, I don't know if your Pizzagate thing is true or not, but it certainly fits with just about every, you know, a dozen other uh, cases that I've heard. I guess back to my point is 
there's a whole other world out there of people who are totally shut down to this. And I think that's really a problem. <laughs> I think it's a problem going forward because if you can't hear the nine nine the nine ninety story that you just te- said, and it, maybe I'll put it this way. This is just my little rant here for a minute. But if you don't hear the if, if there's two ways to react to the nine ninety story. First is okay. Next, give me the next. You know this. Uh, if they're listening to to me, they're going. Alex is on this another wacky thing. Next show, right? But the other thing is to go. Oh, I gotta immediately go Google that. I got to Google the shit out of that. I got to spend the next two hours getting to the absolute rock bottom of that. Because if that's true, that's going to fundamentally change something I believe, you know? And if we can't get more people into that second category of saying, well, I don't know if it's true or not, but I know enough to know that that's something that has to be investigated. If we can't get there, I mean, that's where I really think they got us exactly, exactly where they want, where, you know, we, we don't know how to figure out what's that old saying? Shit from Shinola. You know, we don't know because we have all the resources right there. We got the freaking internet, the, the great, even, right. even as much, isn't it? Even as much as they've taken away, there's still enough there to, to do stuff. I totally agree. I totally agree. Here we are. I thought this was going to be the full on information age dump and everybody was going to be up on there. And no, uh, it was uh, the World Wide Web became quite the disappointment. Well, or. or, Well, I mean, as far as we became, we became right, right. The truth community became quite the disappointment, you know, like, uh, hey, so one thing we are going to got to talk about today because in that topic. I mean, we got to talk about flat earth. Oh, God. Because, <laughs> man, I hear you saying two completely different things about flat earth. And one of them I totally get and I totally think is important to kind of understand, you know, in terms of just this kind of uber empiricism, like show me, prove me everything because I don't believe anything anymore. But the other thing I hear you saying is, you know, you're kind of a space guy. So it's like on another level, I don't think you're taking it literally true, but more as a kind of metaphor for, you know, kind of questioning what we, what we know and what we believe. What well, we're, exactly. am I misreading no, that? No, that's exactly correct. And anyone that I've had on the show about flat earth, uh, would never actually state that they believe the earth is flat. Uh, it was always an investigation into de- deconstructing reality. Like how much empirical data do you actually function from? You know, it, you you look at an earth and, and we're, you know, it could be flat. It could be. You don't know. And that's the more important thing, not to state that you know. And to realize that you have been lied to over and over throughout your entire existence by a conglomerate of scientism. And so how much do you believe because you actually know it? Or how much do you believe because you've been told it? And do you really think there is a, a earth core? Like, uh, you know, uh, to, nobody's been inside the earth. <laughs> you know, we've never cut a planet in half to see what it is. Uh So it was always about deconstructing reality to the empirical data that you actually have and then go, you know, I'm I'm more than willing to play thought games and see where they go with it. Uh, But me, no, I totally believe in space. I don't believe in a dome. Uh, I I watch way too many rocket launches to think that they're just dumping them in the ocean. You know, that was always my big question. Well, what about all these rockets, man? I'm watching five rocket launches a week uh, this year. You know, 2020 was like the year of rockets. Uh, 
And so what are you saying about those? And, you know, they, well, they just dump those in the ocean. There's just a pile of rockets in the ocean. You know? But then you got to, you know, then you got the whole, did we land on the moon? You know, that comes into the story. And I don't know, but obviously not in the craft that they showed us. Um, and, you know, but then you got things like Buzz Aldrin's uh, monolith on Phobos. And there's absolute proof of the monolith on Phobos, sort of. <laughs> because there was a mission to Phobos and they wanted to see inside Phobos. They wanted to see if Phobos was hollow. This was a recent mission, you know, within the last you know, five years, 10 years, something like that. I covered it when it happened. And uh, they had to announce to us that we would not be able to see the monolith on Phobos because the cameras had to be shut off for them to run silent past Phobos and, and be able to see inside, you know? So they announced, I mean, NASA announced, well, we won't be able to show you the monolith. Uh, so, you know, there was some confirmation at least that there was a monolith on Phobos. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a space kid. I grew up at Cape Canaveral. I watched almost every rocket launch there was, you know, I've been there. I've done that. I've touched them, you know? <laughs> so, so let me, let me float something else out there. And I don't know exactly where you're coming down on this, but I can kind of guess And that like, so again, you know, first of all, your background, which we talked about a little bit is amazing it's kind of scary in a way, you know, for me, you know, I'm a dad, I got four kids and to think, to think of a kid going through, you know, the experience that you did. I mean, it's just, it's just, I don't know. You're, you seem like a very, you're making a huge contribution. It's served you well in so many ways, but at the same time, I hate to think that, you know, there's some trauma there that just comes along. I guess we're all traumatized. So I don't, I don't want to make a big deal out. It's your fucking life. <laughs> Not mine, but I wasn't raised that way. You know, I was raised very conventional Midwest, you know, dad was in business and, you know, we went to the Greek Orthodox church, but we all know it was bullshit. We were scared as hell because it scared the hell out of us, but you know, it was like business. So that's what I did, man. I played football and I uh, did business and I made money but all along, I was like taking yoga classes from Yogananda out here in California on correspondence and not telling anyone because, you know, there was just something, there was that side of me too that I didn't know. And I was always determined that if I got to a point where I didn't have to, you know, just work for a living that I wanted to figure out the big picture questions, you know, who are we, why are we here kind of stuff. So I did. And, you know, and then I was podcasting was just, it was just a vehicle, you know, it was just like, Hey, you know, th these people, will act, if you say you have a show, <laughs> all these cool people will actually talk to you, you right. know, and call them up kind of thing. But it kind of, that's a kind of a long way around the barn way of getting to this science thing that is kind of important to me because I think we are going to need science going forward. And I think what we've experienced in this last year is kind of like, you know, the, the final slap in your face, joke science kind of explosion where these guys don't even feel like they need to really even present any science. It's just all fake it's all overtly fake and they don't even pretend like it's anything else they're just gonna pass along edicts and you know you're gonna follow it and there's no they don't even pretend like there's a phony baloney scientific board that's reviewing it it's just like hey man this is it you know and we were asleep at the switch with uh some of us were some of us weren't i wasn't you know, when they tried to pull the whole thing with, with climate change and they got called on it over and over again. And I think they kind of learned their lesson this time. They're like, no, we ain't even, go we ain't even going that way. But again, I'm, maybe I'm a long way around the barn because my point is this flat earth stuff, this looks so psyopy to me. It looks like such a controlled uh, meme narrative to implant into this 
alt-alt community, this truther community, whatever you want to call it, that we're a part of, that I feel like I'm a part of, it seems like such a fucking head fake to immediately divide people. Because like I say, you know, Freeman, if I go back through my interviews, there's 200 people that I could never even, they, I, I wouldn't even have a chance of talking to them if I said, well, you know, flat earth, I mean, maybe we don't know this. It would be a non-starter. It would be not even wrong kind of thing. It is so, and, and the fact that it's gained so much traction, and again, so this is a legitimate question here. It's not really a rant because my experience in doing my show, and I've done my show for a long time, the first I really heard about flat earth, because I didn't even, is out of nowhere, people were popping up with, you know, show suggestions to do a show on flat earth, because I had a kind of a sciencey show. And I was like, wow, that's really strange. Why, why are they coming at me with flat earth if they've ever and they always had this phony baloney like oh i love the show i listen to the show all the time you should do this i'm like if you fucking knew anything about the show you wouldn't be sending me an email on flat earth so who is trying to kind of promote this dialogue this debate scientific debate about flat earth it just seems so psyopy to me yeah yeah, there's a couple of examples that I've had throughout my career. And first, I wanted to go back to my youth and just to tell you that if you wanted to know what my youth was like, uh, watch The Wonder Years. It's friggin' my life. It's crazy. I showed it to my mom while she was dying. I was taking care of my mom while she was passing from cancer. And I turned on The Wonder Years for her and said, just watch this. She was tripping out. It was as if they were in our living room, except for I have a big remind sister. People, remind people about the, the wonder years what it was great show yeah i honestly didn't watch it uh i watched it later on in life um and was just kind of tripping out because it was so similar to my life but uh so i can't honestly tell you anything about the wonder years but, but it's a show i think it's from like the early 2000s or the 1990s but it's really kind of set in the late 60s 70s of a kind of kid growing up who you know, is trying to, uh, is faced with all this wonder, but his family isn't really open, doesn't seem to be open to a lot of wonder, but maybe they are kind of thing, right? I mean, it's kind of a- Yeah, yeah. And that was totally my life. I mean, literally, my mom was tripping out because it really, you know, same, same age, same year, same everything. And so- uh, that one, that one could even freak my mom out on her deathbed. <laughs> like, oh my, oh my God, I'm watching my life on the wonder years. Okay. But, uh, on, on back to the flat earth, I just want anybody to think that I was like raised in some sort of crazy cult or, uh, you know, MK ultra thing. It was, no, I had a wonderful, wonderful youth. Uh, it was, you know, I had an absent father, but you know, whatever he took care of us. Uh, <clears throat> But as far as like knowledge and, and, and emotions, the, the, you know, there wasn't any of that. But OK, so back to the flat earth, though, I, I, there's been a couple examples in my career where I'm a grassroots reporter, right? Like I started the Freeman Perspective. No one had ever seen a TV show like that before. When I unveiled the corporate logos, the high profile rituals, uh, you know, I, I already was so far ahead that uh you know, my TV show was like this major hit. Um, but of course, it was just on access in Texas. You know, it wasn't until later when Google came out with video that we could start putting it online. But um, and you said it, it was in Austin with Alex Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if I get into that story real quick, I, I, I got to Austin. I didn't know of Alex Jones. So I had, it turns out I had heard of him, but I didn't know that. Like I had seen his Bo Bohemian Grove film at like three in the morning on Bravo. Uh, but when I got to Austin, I started hearing him on the radio. So this was 2004 and I didn't know of Alex then. And so I started to learn uh, listening to him. So he would give an address of where his studios were. So I went to hunt him down. Now, I was just living in my van on Christmas Light Street in Austin. I did the TV show for, uh, while living in my van. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I was only in Austin for the weekend. And uh, 
all right, I'll give you the whole story. <laughs> we're, we're just going to have to turn this into, uh, you're going to have to give me this recording because I didn't start recording yet. <laughs> no, no, but this, this is classic stuff. I mean, the visual I'm getting is unbelievable. Alex has gone to Bohemian Grove. He's exposed like for, for a lot of us in this com community, it's just like a monumental event, you know, Alex Jones and the, 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 the in there with, uh, yeah. So, so there you are and you're about to meet Alex Jones because you're just living in your van driving around from state to state because you and your nephew were hanging out in Daytona beach and had a freaking five hour missing time with this huge UFO in the sky. So you're now just a wandering kind of mystic kind of guy. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, no, I wandered the earth and I told the, the secret history of, of the world. You know, I was studying the 12th planet as Enki and Enlil and the, the Lulu and all of that. So I was wandering the earth telling everybody the secret mysteries of life on planet earth as if I were like an alien, right? Just visiting your planet and telling you what you don't know. And so I'm in Austin, Texas for the weekend and I get, I meet this homeless guy on a, on a city bus. And he's like kind of, I mean, anyone else probably would have been scared off by him. He had one white eye, his gray hair, all greasy and tied back, but he was so happy. He was like the most jovial guy ever. And he bounces over the bus and he lands in the seat next to me. And he says, you just look so interesting. I want to do your numerology. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> so he does my numerology and he's like, you're the goddess. You're the goddess. Oh my God. Now, what was really weird is I, I was, I ended up making a film about the goddess, about Columbia. And I was the only expert you will ever find on Columbia and, and who she was and why she's our capital and all of that. And uh, so that was kind of weird that I ended up unveiling the goddess as my second television show because this guy kept saying you're the goddess you're the goddess but so it turns out he lives in his van just a couple of blocks from where i live in my van and uh he leaves a note on my van that says oh you got to go to this mall there's a speaker there and you really should see it and i didn't know who or what or anything but I went ahead, he gave me all the bus routes, you know, cause you just leave your van where it's parked, take the bus. But I took the bus to the mall. I get to the mall, it's like a dead mall. You know, I don't even think the stores were open. I don't know, there was nobody there, but I saw a few people wandering around. So I followed and I found out there that there was a speaker there and it was George Green. And George Green was the uh, ex-financial advisor to Jimmy Carter, you know, who my dad knew. And he was a Bilderberger, he was a billionaire and all of this. And he had gone out to uh, Switzerland and met with Billy Meyer and was now publishing the books written by the Palladians, or as they were known then as the Plajarans, uh, which was Handbook for New Paradigm, I think is what it was called. So, so, so Billy Meyer, just in case people forget, is this guy who had these incredible photos of UFOs later exposed that some of them at least were not at all legit but we never really come to the bottom of that story of you know this misinformation disinformation real information kind of thing but there were a lot of people who really looked into it who thought he was totally legit and still believe he's totally legit so this is like just a moonshot that you're there and george green is talking about just coming back from I mean, that had to be, no one knew Billy Meyer at this point. It was like, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I did, I guess, because I knew like Al, uh, um, uh, on the X-Files, you know, uh, Fox Mulder's poster was a Billy Meyer. Yeah, 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 know? that's right, right. Um, but I'm sorry, keep keep going with the story. You're at the mall. Yeah, what, yeah. So, so, what is George Green? So George Green is like talking to just like, a handful of people that are meeting at an abandoned mall in Austin. Yeah. Yeah. And what was really weird is I had met a number of the people in the audience. Like, you know, I was only there for a couple of days and, and uh, the few people that I had met were all there. And then it turned out they all knew each other. So I was kind of tripping out on all of that. And uh, George Green is showing us how magnativity uh, gives you free energy and anti-gravity 
he showed how you could take a piece of PVC tube and put magnets inside of it. And if you leave one space blank, you can put that over a magnet and it'll make the magnet rotate. And, you know, he showed us all the examples of this and showed us how on the, the Billy Meyer spacecraft, they had these large spheres around the top of the spacecraft, but one sphere was missing. And so he showed us how the magnetic propulsion worked and all of that. And then he handed us all a copy of uh, Handbook for a New Paradigm, which I read and did not jive with at all. Like it did not, it didn't go with me at all. Like I've read all the Barbara Mar Marciniacs and the Barbara Hand clothes, and I was a Palladian. Like when I was wandering the earth telling people I was an alien, I believed I was Palladian, you know, not like I had come from space, but that my soul had, you know, and so. I was free to just talk uh, these things openly with people. And I knew things that no one knew, uh, such as uh, uh, Saddam Hussein claiming to be Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. And then they used the mother of all bombs in the shock and awe. So the Moabs attacked mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar mm -hmm. and shock and awe is a, is a play on the Hebrew word Shekinah, which is the whirlwind, which George Bush mentioned. So I was talking about these type of ritualistic aspects of warfare and, and all of that. And so during a, a break in the lecture, I, we were all standing outside and I started telling people these things. And as I'm talking, this seven foot blonde man <laughs> comes storming over. He kind of freaked me out for a minute, but I could see that he was friendly. He had a nice smile on his face, but he was like super tall and blonde, you know? And uh, he's like, you need a TV show. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, no, no, seriously, I want to put you on television. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, am I really ready to stick my face out there in the midst of all that I believe? and actually you know come forward as me on television talking about this stuff i'm like i don't know and he says no no look i'll write you a check right here and now if you take it down to access studios and sign up for for a tv show and i'm like oh, man do you know i had like five seconds to decide whether i was gonna literally put my face out there for big brother or satan to take down and i was like all right let's do it let's do it uh, uh. and so he hands me the check and i go down to access studios i sign up to be a producer and i get my time slot and as i had said i'd been trying to hunt down alex jones all this time and i couldn't find him because he lies about where his studio is which makes sense and uh there's alex you know so it turns out the universe made sure that i was on the same plane as alex to meet him you see, because if I had met him in any other way, he would have just ignored me. He wouldn't have cared who I was. But because we were now both access studios, I was in the club. Yeah. And so I walk in the very first moment I see Alex and I'm like, hey, you know, I've been waiting to meet you. And um, I said, I said to him, well, I heard you were the only other person to predict 9-11 to the day. And he said, well, uh, not to the day. And I was like, oh, because <laughs> I had, you know, but I didn't predict what would happen. You know, he was closer to predicting what would happen. And, but I knew the day because I follow Kabbalism and, and, and the magic and such. And so I was able to predict that you know, there's going to be a major terrorist attack on 9-11. Don't freak out. This is all for your reaction was my actual quote. Um, but so, uh, you know, so I got to kind of polish my fingernails after Alex saying he didn't predict the day. And, and then I was like, you know, you know that the owl is not Molech, right? That it's actually a representation of the goddess within the Illuminati, that they're owl worshipers and that these all go to the goddess, uh, Minerva and Diana. And I didn't know back. that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the Illuminati has never used an eye in the pyramid symbol. That's Freemason. Uh, the, and these were the things I was trying to stamp down once, uh, my, once my information reached the public, it suddenly expanded into this mythos, you know, it went from my science to a mythology. And so I've been trying to stamp those fires out all this time saying, no, look, you know, but nobody will listen to me because they don't realize that I'm the guy who came up with the idea, you know, the, how that happened is I actually, once I learned dad was Freemason, I, I dug deep. I've been to every Mason temple in America, uh, just about. I mean, the major ones, the 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 uh, Grand Lodges. 
I've been to every, almost every Grand Lodge in America and in London and in Australia uh, and even in Guatemala. I went to the lodge there. Well, all of the Mason, all the Mayans that I was with in Guatemala were Masons. So anyway, I got so deep into this. I've been to the Temple of the 33rd I, countless times. I, I'm friends with the head librarian. She loved me so much. She wanted to take me through the whole building, show me all the floor plans, secretly gave me copies of Morals and Dogma and the Glossary of Morals and Dogma and told me to sneak out of the 33rd with them. Uh, you know, this all happened. And I studied their rituals. I have my dad's handbooks he was worshipful master so i have all his secret encoded rituals that i decoded because i was always into ciphers and everything when i was a kid so i did so decoded these entire ritual books and now, thank now, god now, I hold, on, hold on just help me out so you show up at these va various freemason temples what's what's your in you know to get beyond just kind of the velvet rope roped off part you know is it your dad is it do they somehow not, connect with you know you're coming I and mean, what is your no plan? not that i know of i i just pay for the tour uh but they somehow, all have tours, but somehow but you're 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 kind of brought in at a deep i level. get singled out right because i i have the right questions and i have the right interests so like when i walked into the 33rd for the first time and met the the head librarian uh she uh, yeah, I was asking her about Manly P. Hall, and and it just turned out that they had the secret teachings of all ages open right there on the on the thirty third table, and so you know then I got all excited about this and was asking about Albert Pike in the Albert Pike room, and that's when she uh, left us and she said, "Now you're not allowed to be alone here, but I'm going to leave you alone here," and she ran off and got the copies of Morals and Dogma and Glossary to Morals and Dogma and, and brought them back and gave them to me in the Albert Pike room, who is the person who wrote Morals and Dogma, uh, and supposedly his ashes were there in the wall too. Uh, so uh, I think it's just because. Well, like I went to the Philosophical Research Society, but this was after I was known, like uh, the, my times at the 33rd, that was in 1999. I didn't have a show yet uh, or 96. It was no, it was 1999 was the first time it was the WTO IMF protest. So essentially what just happened on January 6th, we did that back in 1999. And uh, against opposing the World Trade Organization and International Monetary Fund, 500,000 people gathered in the streets. But what had happened was the, just the week before was the Battle of Seattle, where the troops opened fire on all the peaceful protesters and shot children and things. And I think they even killed a lady uh, due to agent provocateurs breaking windows, right? So, of course, I covered that story right before january 6th because i wanted everybody to know how this would fall you know they're gonna have agent provocateurs breaking the windows and then the the stormtroopers will come in and so of course that's exactly what happened um but i experienced that back in 99 and and uh that was the first time i just stumbled into the the supreme council temple of the 33rd i didn't even know that it was on that block in that neighborhood it's in a very odd space and I just stumbled across it. And so me and my friend, uh, we decided, well, let's- And let's I'm sorry, go. what city What city is this in? This is Washington, DC. This is in DC, that's what I thought, yeah, okay. Yeah, so they had the battle for Seattle against the WTO IMF and there was a full on uh, attack on the, the protesters. So in defiance of that, I went to DC when the protest moved there the next week and of course, it was a big party in the streets. There was no violence. There was nothing. Everybody just had a good time. Although I watched 600 people get arrested for parading without a permit. Uh, another interesting moment in that was when I was yelling at all those riot squads about these people's uh, rights. And then they gave me no response. So I yelled at them, how many of you are widow's sons? Which is code word for Freemason. And every head in that riots line turned my direction. I was like, oh, <laughs> so I backed out. And that was actually my very first interview on indie media uh, back in 99 was the first time I did an interview on that. But so I just stumbled upon the Temple of the 33rd in D.C. as we were wandering around. And 
1993, I had actually occupied Bill Clinton's White House for nine days. I slept in his front lawn with a hundred other hippies. We all slept in the White House lawn for nine days. Um, but anyway, uh, so I stumbled into the, the Temple of the 33rd and 99 and WTO protest. And here we are standing in front of these massive lion knocker doors. You know, they're like 12 feet tall doors. And uh, there's no there's a little button <laughs> it says ring bell. And I'm like, you know, I'm sitting there like red and snippy, like, do I push it? Do I push it? And before I even got a chance to push it, another Mason walked up behind us. And when I say another Mason, people think I'm a Mason. I'm not, never have been, never swore to lodge, nothing, but I've been deep inside of all of this. But a Mason walked up behind us. And at that moment, the door opened in front of us. And so then we're just kind of caught in the middle. And they say, what do you gentlemen want? And I said, well, we want to see the library. And they said, oh, come on in. And I was just so excited. I was just like out of my skin. And the, the, the lead librarian caught up on my excitement and wanted to show me everything. And so that was my first time there. And then, since then, but then I got the TV show, started presenting all of this stuff. And then I went to the Philosophical Research Society, which was run by Manly P. Hall, which if you guys don't know about Manly P. Hall and his philosophies, I highly recommend them. Uh, he wrote uh, Secret Destiny of America and uh, um, uh, that other book I mentioned earlier. Uh, morals and uh no no not that's albert pike uh that's manly pike. p hall uh wrote secret destinies of america and um eh, whatever i'll get it'll it'll flash back in a minute but uh when i got in there i walked in and i was instantly recognized by the doctorate uh people like they hold doctorate degrees there at the philosophical research society i was an instant celebrity walking into this place had no idea i was going to be welcome like that was given granted the honor of sitting in manly p hall's chair which is like unheard of now, now uh, freeman is this because the show had somehow gone you know kind of gone bigger than just austin kind of thing yeah 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 once the tv show got on google i had millions and millions and millions of followers and then once they took me from google and put me on youtube uh, i was completely shadow banned i can't even upload my own videos to youtube most of them like my lectures uh, side side note discussion after you get done with this because i want you to finish that story uh, I, I think there's an interesting uh little point there of maybe the first guy to really be shadow banned because yeah. people so many people to this day don't even understand or acknowledge that that's a real thing but so you 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 get the honor of sitting in manly p hall's chair and you know the other thing that i just would love to hear you comment on because i always I've heard this, you know, and you hear this from different people is that part, what, what fun is it to be in this kind of occulted knowledge if you can't reveal it sometimes, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like the, right? Because don't you find that with these people, it's like what's going on now. They kind of want to put it in your face in a way. They want to hide it from like some people, but then for other of us, they want to kind of rub it in the face. What do you think of that as, as you're sitting in Manly P. Hall's chair? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not much into exclusivity, really. Uh, so yeah, that was always, uh, I even, you know, to get into your type of topics, I did a, a, a past life regression, a Jungian uh -huh. past life regression and it turns out in my regression i don't know you know how much but it, it turns out i was i was like this fat bald egyptian or arabic or something uh look i look like the guy in um aladdin the little fat uh -huh. dude right <laughs> yeah right uh -huh. <laughs> and it turns out that i had gone into the egyptian priests and stolen their book and had mm. running out to share it with the public. And I was cleaved uh, with a oh. sword through my collarbone, straight down through my heart. And that was my death. And so uh, that was my Egyptian past life. <laughs> I was actually trying to steal the knowledge from the Egyptian priests and give it to the people. Crazy. Okay, mm. so you're back in 
I mean, what I was just reacting to is it's, it's, it's a huge, if people are even following the story this far, you know, the another huge leap, but it's also like, we've heard it so many times is that somehow they know that you are kind of supposed to be there, supposed to be, you know, in the I chair. Have, I have an angelic shine, right? I'm fully alive when I'm out there on the road like that. And maybe even most, you know, here, I'm sure you know, residual, but I shine like an angel and people feel that. And miracles happen in my life every day of the week when I'm on the road. It's crazy. And, and that's the thing that I spend most of my time trying to convince people of is miracles happen. I mean, everybody lost faith in miracles this last week. Uh, there's a lot of people who are severely defeated. Um, but yet my life shows me over and over again that there's a greater guiding force if you're open to it that guides you exactly where you should be instead of where you think you need to be. And that's just been my life and giving up all egoic drive and just allowing the universe to open the potentials for me. And I found that it knew me way better than I know me and it knew the world way better than I knew the world. And I kept just getting guided to all the right places at all the right time. Like people would ask me, how did you survive 10 years on the road without a bank account without, you know, weren't you hungry in the streets? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I lived the life of a multimillionaire. I was always at the best parties. I was always at the best events. I was always in the woods or, you know, in beauty, um, you know, every life, every day was fulfilled with just great joy and wonder. And so I think that registers with people when they feel that they want to be a part of it. And so then you get pulled in and uh, I think that's more of what it was. Oh. Yeah. That's, that's, that's amazing. I gotta, I gotta punctuate that because it's so freaking awesome what you're saying. And I also think that if people can get beyond kind of the trauma shock that they feel, which my thing is always is you're, you're triggered Hey, it's your job not to be fucking triggered. You know what I mean? Right. So build up your system so that you're not triggered. But to your point, when you look into the eyes of the people who right now seem to be our enemies, I see fear. I don't see yes. the thing. Yes. I don't see what you're talking about. I don't see the angelic love, the wonder, the divinity, the... It's all part of a plan. I see freaking fear, man. Yeah. And that is empowering because it's like, oh, okay, I get it. That's where you're at. Okay. Sorry. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I feel for them. The moment Joe Biden supposedly, you know, was inaugurated, I was like, ah, uh, sorry, guy. <laughs> you're gonna get what you what you deserve and i'm sorry about that uh this is you, you just entered hell and you have no idea but you know so i feel for you biden and harris you know you're gonna have uh quite the oh, <laughs> turmoil you what, what's yeah i mean at a soul level i mean yeah we just we don't know you know i just i just kind of go with that with that we don't know so you know hey this is a, a fantastic story we gotta we gotta keep going here we can't stop we can't leave them hanging again you're sitting in manly p hall's chair because you're the guy right then you're the guy so yeah. what happens next well it, 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 honestly that was that was the the height of it all in that sense just to to be recognized like i was and yeah, shadow banning was happening back with, with Google videos. I had millions and millions of views and then I'd watch the numbers dump down to hundreds of thousands and, and lower. So yeah, even before YouTube, because I'm actually in a documentary about being one of the first YouTubers, but that's because my show goes way back before YouTube and, and you know, YouTube was an afterthought to me. I'm like, well, do I really want to break my videos into 15 minutes and put it on YouTube? Eh, why not? I'll make, I'll, you know, I'll make a few little bits just to make my mark on YouTube. And now I'm in a documentary uh, about being, you, a, you know, uh, you know, we ought to, because I'm a, I'm a tech guy, you know, and used to have a tech business and grew up in that and, and kind of know all that stuff. Cause I was, 
living it on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of people forget YouTube was a startup that Google acquired. Right. And they paid this just ridiculous, what seemed at the time to be a ridiculous amount of money. And I always, you know, uh, uh, Novak, you know, the guy who does, uh, 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 oh, what's their, their show? Their super popular uh, show. Oh, man. Um, I hate when I forget. I know. Um, I know. Secret Teachings of All Ages was the book I was trying to think of, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go plug that back in. So anyways, Google, who at the beginning, the, the running... Uh, kind of whisper secret from the beginning with Google is that they're NSA, right? It's there's these couple of really smart kids who figured out this search algorithm that was like freaking next level and it immediately drew the attention of the people that are monitoring that stuff. And they said, okay, we want to piece that action. You're going to go forward. You're going to be, you know, at the time it wasn't billionaire thing. It was millionaire thing. And, but we're going to be kind of in that. And then YouTube, and there's actually this famous quote from the guys, I don't know if this video is still out there, but the two kids who started YouTube and the day they're acquired, they're like, well, you know, in typical, you know, you have to remember back at that kind of uh, the internet explosion kind of thing where these kids are totally unqualified, you know, well, I think it's going to be a great partnership between us and Google, you know, and the, we're the king of video and they're the king of search. <laughs> it's like these two kids, of course, the next day are like gone, you know, like, hey, here's your money, go do what you want, but you will not be a part of this going forward. I just think it's so interesting that what you're adding to that story, Freeman, is that your videos uh, uh, immediately start being shadow banned in just in case people don't know, you know, shadow ban is when you're banned to the world, but no one is saying that you're banned to the world. No one, you right. don't know it. The audience doesn't know it. And the only guy who knows it is some AI bot manager in Google who's playing with the knobs, you know, behind the curtain deciding what people see and don't see. And for the longest time, you know, I tell this story, I mean, I had a friend because I was in tech, you know, and selling my company and I knew a bunch of people in Silicon Valley and stuff like that. And I would, I, I kind of got wind of this and I would tell people, you know, what about the shadow ban? What about the demonetization, which, which was the other thing that they did, you know, without notice and without any kind of uh, recourse, you know, people would have their videos just, oh, that one isn't making money anymore. What's what's going on? And it kind of is a psychological thing, too. It's like, whoa, you know, what control do I have? But anyways, when I talk to people in Silicon Valley about that, th they just couldn't even wrap their head around that. They would just be like, no, no, because Google had this at the there was this whisper that they were NSA, but at the same time, there was this other just kind of, you know, wrap the techie flag around it. Like this is the greatest thing and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And, you know, we're going to be part of this whole new kind of thing. And Google's a part of that. And we're the good guys kind of thing. And the shadow banning thing didn't fit in with the, and the NSA thing didn't fit in with that story. And now, I mean, it's so funny. I mean, now you wouldn't have any problem. It's 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 in your face again. Back to the the point I was making about like kind of the occult thing is, I think the next level on the occult thing is to kind of rub it in somebody's face. I mean, when you ban people, you know, you ban the president of the United States. You know, I mean, or start putting warnings on his. You know, I mean, you can't. You can't, I don't care what you feel about Trump. I got a whole lot of reservations with Trump. You know, I don't care what you think. No one, back when you started your show, you know, back at the turn of the century or whenever, right. you, you, people would have thought you were freaking nuts if you did a Freeman Fly, Fry, Freeman Fly prediction saying, oh yeah, and the president of the United States will first be muzzled and kind of restricted in terms of what he has to, what he could say. He won't be covered by any of the news organizations. And then eventually he'll be banned while he's in office. I mean, if you would have predicted that, people would have just said you're freaking nuts. But it was all, I guess where I was coming at is it, it, you were the first, one of the first people to kind of experience that with this kind of 
shadow banning, which you got to put the pieces together and say, well, that was always part of the freaking plan, right? Yeah, yeah. And add to that, that all my videos were monetized by YouTube, by Google, but I don't get any of that. Like I didn't monetize my videos, they did. So all the ads that have been on my videos since, uh, you know, 2005, uh, go to whoever gets them. I don't know. I, the, the commercials you see on my videos are not going to me. What, what, uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? Process that on a really just kind of base level. Like you own the copyrights for those videos you uploaded. Them? Oh, or you uploaded them way back in the day on Google. And then Google said, well, we'll just roll those into YouTube, but those will just go into a separate bucket over here. Yeah, we'll roll those into your YouTube channel. So they showed up late and then uh, then they monetize them. Uh, but but I don't just I, kind of forgot to kind of connect that little monetization with Freeman's account. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I did eventually monetize my videos. And uh, I was able to get enough money together, buy a house, things like that, you know, like, it, you know, I didn't, you know, got a down payment. But uh, then at, at that very moment, they they deleted all all my monetization and then they took Alex Jones down. And at that same moment, they came after me. So a number of my videos are gone. Uh, a lot of them are gone. And at first they had just demonetized about 90% of my videos. Then they just fully demonetized me. And then they gave me all the strikes. Uh, right when they were taking Alex Jones down, they were also taking me down. But somehow I never got the third strike. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, maybe they just, you know, I don't know. Maybe they didn't want to make me too popular by, uh, you know, banning me and making me known. So they just left me in the shadow ban realms. They didn't, they never gave me the third strike. Uh, the irony is, is that YouTube was started by two guys that wanted to see Janet Jackson bear her breast at the Super Bowl, which is in my second film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the whole reason YouTube was built was because they could not find a video clip of Janet Jackson's uh, you know, wardrobe malfunction, which was actually a high profile ritual, which I covered uh, in my second TV show about Columbia, the goddess. And uh, so the irony is that that's the whole reason YouTube started. Uh, but see now, okay, so going back to Flat Earth and how popular it got real quick, I'll throw this out as, a, as an independent grassroots filmmaker and documentarian or whatever you want to call me, um, Zeitgeist came out. Right. And it's like guys immediately got millions and millions and millions of views. And I said, no, that doesn't happen. Right. Like I'm 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 a grassroots reporter on this information. Like I started this conversation and for them to suddenly just be on the, you know, everybody was talking about the guys. Believe me, it was a personal insult. So <laughs> when, when, you know, and it's all wrong, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, so everything in there. And then Zeitgeist's final conclusion is that humans are evil and need to be controlled by AI, but nobody seemed to notice that. But anyway. Really? Say yeah. that again? Yeah, if you get to Zeitgeist 3, uh, they announce uh, the, what is it? The Venus Project, which Venus is Lucifer. Uh, is the Venus Project down in Florida? Yeah. Yeah, that's all zeitgeist no oriented. Way. And then they tell you actually humans can't uh, be trusted and everything needs to go under AI and robot control. So that was the zeitgeist finale in Zeitgeist 3. Uh, but instantly when they were saying, you know, when it was on, you know, I was I was personally hurt by everybody going to zeitgeist and not knowing my work. And I'm like, this can't be grassroots, you know, just like Flat Earth. It's like there's no way it gets this popular this quick. As another example of that, I put out the whole Obama is a clone of Akhenaten. And I prove it to you over and over again with imagery, with the DNA, with everything. Now, I'm not saying that I know that this is a fact because I don't have Barack Obama's DNA, but if I had Barack Obama's DNA, then I could prove it. And I could prove everything that I've shown about this to, you know, everything I did show is true. Uh, it just comes down to that one last final factor for me to say that it's absolutely true, but uh, they have Akhenaten's DNA. And if they were gonna clone anyone, it would be Akhenaten. 
Akhenaten yeah, is. The... I, I got to pump the brakes on that until we All investigate right. it. But I think there's a whole bunch of different, you, you know, the one thing I would just interject, and this might be a conversation we'll have down the road is in the extended realm of, you know, how reality is created and we're co-creators of that reality. And there are also kind of divisions in that reality, breakoffs in that reality, you know, and ET seems to be in that reality. And then lo and behold, you know, you take DMT and they're in that reality and there's a shamanic reality. And then I, I just think there's a lot of possible, a lot of possible connections in terms of genetic engineering, cloning, you know, yeah, look the, into Lulu and Nanan. No, I, I will. And I, I will. But when I heard that before, I just think that's going to be a little bit of a of a moonshot to people. And that's OK. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. not trying. No, I don't want to put I don't want to kind of put a stop on that. Like, oh, my God, you know, it's the crazy line thing. You know, oh, that's my crazy line. Don't go over that. Or I, I flush the whole thing down the toilet. I'm just saying that might be one that we could have a further conversation on down the road because the other thing that obama about obama that seems kind of undeniable is you know he's the son of a you know teen what's the mtv show before you know 16 and pregnant or you know teen mom kind of thing this this rebellious teen mom whose dad happens to be freaking cia all over the place with this furniture store you know all this i'm just sharing mm -hmm. it with the audience mm -hmm. you know Oh, I have these uh, furniture stores and I move from intelligence base to intelligence base around the country and I wind up in Seattle and now my daughter is totally rebelling. So now I move her to Hawaii and now she's really rebelling and she goes, gets knocked up by this communist guy who's writing the communist newspaper who happens to be this black guy and what do I do now? You know, I have to create this story of this african guy who really is the father kind of thing i mean that's my i think the evidence for that if that's too much of a moonshot for people is just kind of overwhelming you know but uh, so I, I i don't know i it, it to me that I, i'll just i'll just leave i'll just leave that and we'll, we'll talk obama sometime in in the future that would be an interesting conversation but you know where i'm going with with the with the whole thing of o Obama's communist father, right? Sure, yeah, yeah and yeah, I, t I told everybody he wasn't going away. But my point wasn't more to prove that Obama was a clone at this moment. It was that if, if you know, if we're looking at, at flat earth, I have as much evidence that Obama's a clone. I really thought that that would take off. I really did. I thought people uh -huh. would be talking about it and, and, and freaking out because if you see it, you you're like holy shit this is crazy you know this could be real and i expected it to at least be a part of the conversation within the conspiratorial realms but it didn't go anywhere like no one picked it up no one talked about it and then next thing i know they're all running around saying michelle's a man and you know now that the story was completely lost uh but if you look at the images that I have of Michelle and, and Queen T, uh, Akhenaten's mother, and you look at Obama and, and Akhenaten, and if you know the history of Akhenaten, then you would realize that this would be what they would do if they had the technology to do it. And just on one note here, just as my own little tooting of my horn, I was announcing this. I was covering this on the show uh, for, for a while, and... I kept saying, well, you know, the problem is they've never actually admitted that they have Akhenaten. Like there's never, they've never revealed the mystery of KV-55, uh, the where they found King Tut and Akhenaten's uh, mummies. They've never actually said whether they were Akhenaten and Queen T and Nefertiti and all of them. And as I'm doing this live on the air, uh, they have a special on, on Giza, and there's the head of the Giza Plateau, Zahi Hawass, stating right. that he had the Discovery Channel build a DNA lab under the, the Cairo Museum. And guess what, folks? I have the DNA of Akhenaten, and he shows it on camera. <laughs> and I'm <Okay>. like, guys, <laughs> guys. Okay, see, now, now one of the things that, that just frustrates me is we're like an hour and 45 minutes into this, and mm -hmm. if we... No one's going to hear that. 
And and so like a, a discussion that I think would be interesting, and it's not really my thing, but it's enough of my thing that you know I'm interested in it is the the Frank Marshall Davis versus Akhenaten cloning thing. Like that's a real discussion that that you could have. And again, it, from my world, it's like. No, it's a discussion that 90% of people will not even, you know, <laughs> I mean, they can't wrap their head around either one of those possibilities. But my point would be, until we can really hammer out uh, both possibilities, you know, um, we're not even in the game. So can can we just kind of put that aside and let's commit to either on Skeptico or on uh, Freeman TV, you know, doing another, you know, di- pulling like that one apart. Cause I, I, I still don't think that the, the, the Frank Marshall Davis thing really got played out to the fullest either in terms of what that means or what that could potentially mean. So you want right. to do that at some time? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to flip the script. And, and honestly, I was only, you know, I wasn't going to try and prove it here, but just uh, show how certain ideas are promoted, like the totally flat earth that. and zeitgeist and others aren't. And uh, well, you know, so, so that would be kind of the, the a great topic. Cause now you got me on the, the Venus thing is super interesting because somebody just pointed me to that the other day in terms of their latest video on COVID, very, very not interesting, very, very cultish, very, very, you know, kind of crazy, kind of lead you in and then flip you kind of the classic kind of cult thing. So, you know, next time it could be the zeitgeist, uh, Venus thing, the Obama thing. And then there was one, oh, you know, the other thing that I think plays into that is uh, the secret is another example, right? Oh, God, yeah. Because the secret kind of takes off in this kind of wacky way. And then who's behind it? You know, Jay-Z Knight, who is just clearly, you know, overtly cult, you know, and she's, do you ever see her husband comes out and kind of outs her and goes, yeah, man, I mean, she's smoking cigarettes behind the stage, you know, before she goes on and then puts on this, fake persona and does this fake channeling but is it all fake you know and then she's buying these horses for like three hundred dollars and selling them for thirty thousand dollars because you're going oh this horse occupy is is run by the spirit or is is holding right. the spirit of the you know kind of thing so i mean that's a whole other topic i would love yeah. to get into with you is yeah. the whole cult thing because i think i think our our inability to really process how the cult thing plays a part of plays a part in this is Wait, it's just that. it's just really interesting because because like the mk hold this Ultra thought thing. one minute hold yeah, on this yeah. thought one minute because i gotta use the restroom <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah okay <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Okay, great. So we ought to try and move towards uh, towards wrapping it up. But I'm writing down. I'm writing down a bunch of because because there's it, I I did remember. Let's let me get this in there because I've been dying to get this in, and I'd love to talk more about it next time. This is maybe a little bit out of your wheelhouse, but I I think it's kind of fun to bring other stuff to people and then see how they process it in because you have this deep knowledge base and maybe it'll connect, but 
you know, where I was going with the, the with, I thought we had fun talking about the YouTube Google thing because people forget so much of that stuff. And then you added the, you know, the ritual thing with the uh, wardrobe malfunction. The first I heard that was from Chris Knowles. Have you had Chris Knowles on your show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Chris is great. He's been on my show multiple times. He was the first guy I heard talk about that, talk about that specific incident, but I'm, I'm sure you covered it really well too. But those YouTube guys, that's an interesting connection. The other thing I would guess I was going to bring up is uh, the no agenda. I was thinking of John Dvorak, you know, he's got that super popular show, no agenda. And I feel like, I don't want to shit on Dvorak because he's great. You know, he's great, great, great guy, super great guy. And I love his, his whole thing, but the guy has been so wrong. If you follow the history, he's been so wrong about tech, you know, like iPhone, he was like, Oh man, there's no way there's no, when it first came out, he's like, Oh, then iPhone two, iPhone three. No, no, the same, never, you know? and the same thing with YouTube. He's like, you no, man, this costs so much money to the, the bandwidth, you know, put it these. So, just as a touch point for me, for a guy who's been in tech, you know, it's interesting to see how, same old thing, you know, who are the experts and who are the real people who know who are kind of behind this thing. But the other thing I was just going to throw out as a topic potentially to talk about next time is Bill Gates, because I always hear this thing about how Bill Gates was, you know, ushered in and stuff like that. Man, I lived through that. Bill Gates got a huge leg up because his mom was, you know, super connected with the president of IBM and he gets the meeting and he gets in there and he scams him into there, not scams him there because Bill Gates was a really good programmer. People forget that. I mean, he was ripping people off playing black, playing poker at Harvard, but the kid could sling code. I mean, he was kind of this Os Asperger kind of guy who could really write code. And even if he took other people's code and rewrote it for its purpose, there, there's a Frick of a talent and doing that, you know, it ain't easy. I used to be a program. You can't just take somebody's code and rewrite it and make it, you know, acceptable to IBM. But the thing I always remind people of is with IBM is IBM got hip to the fact that they might lose the keys to the kingdom in their relationship with Microsoft early on. So, you know, there's the DOS thing, the old computer screen with the little green letters on it. And then it's all going to uh, you know, graphic user interface like Apple had and, and IBM and Windows or uh, Microsoft saw that they had to copy and they came up with Windows. But it was nip and tuck there of there was really Microsoft with Windows, they weren't going to make it. And the way they make it is with a total kludge. You know, Balmer, who's the CEO of Microsoft, hires this intern over the summer and he figures out this really kludgy, kludgy way to make Windows work in a way that what was uh, IBM software, OS, you even forget about it now, but they had the competing operating system there. So this is totally geeky stuff, but the way it kind of connects, I think, is in a way, Freeman, it kind of connects with where we started on this whole thing, is that one of the mistakes I think we make is not processing everyone's experience as being a spiritual experience. Because everyone's experience is a spiritual experience. Right. I don't know what the fuck Bill Gates is doing. I don't know what kind of child porn he has on his computer and why he does that and what motivates him. But I know he's a spiritual being living in this kind of biological robot existence and he's in the soup every day just like I am and to forget that I think I think we run the risk of kind of forgetting our real uh, both power and responsibility in this whole thing in terms of how we're supposed to be how we're supposed to be that kind of shining divine being that sits in the chair because everyone just sees that that's where you belong. You know what I mean? I think so. <laughs> well, I think, I, I, I think it, to me, it goes back to the fear thing. You know, it's that when I hear people talk about uh, Bill Gates nowadays and what he's doing, I mean, he is being literally demonized which 
in a way might be accurate in a way that we don't fully understand. And I'm open to that possibility. And I think that has to be factored into, you know, the possibility. Right. I think we make a real mistake if we don't see him also as somebody who's trying to figure the whole thing out in terms of their relationship to, you know, whatever that, whatever happens after we die, whatever happens in the extended consciousness realm, whatever happens in all this other stuff. I'm still not, I'm still not hitting anything you really can latch on to, huh? Well, I'm, I'm comparing it and, and understanding, yes, uh, that everybody believes they are doing the right thing. See, I, I wouldn't say that. I, no? I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I think some people think that they're doing evil and they don't really know quite how to get out of it. You know, if you just go watch, because I just wrote my, my book, Why Evil Matters, you know, and uh, how science and religion fumble the big one. And the premise of the book is that science just denies evil. They go, oh, well, it's just a moral construct because you can't have evil because you don't even have consciousness. You know, you're just, your life is meaningless. You're just a biological robot. So science is like, so, uh, but I think that's psyop, but that's kind of a whole other discussion. And then you have religion who says, oh no, I'll tell you exactly what evil is. You know, it's right here in this little book and I will be the intermediary of telling you what it is and what it isn't. And all, all that stuff, all that stuff doesn't work if, if you really analyze it. But what I think, you know, back to the, the Ted Bundy thing, you know, the one thing you can watch on Netflix. Well, there's two things. One, you can watch uh, Leslie Kane's uh, fucking unbelievable top five Netflix series documentary on surviving death. And I just had her on the show. It's an incredibly well done, you know, reincarnation, past life regression stuff, but you know, also near death experience. It's, it's spectacular. It's great. It's all the rest of that. But I digress slightly because you go watch Ted Bundy and Ted Bundy is kind of a weird kid who, you know, but is just kind of weird in a normal way. And then he has this kind of weird sexual obsession. And he says himself that he just kind of scratched the itch in a way that invited in something evil, for lack of a better word, and how that thing became greater and greater and greater to the point where it just kind of took over. So this is, and this is underreported, you know, you can, it's right there in, yeah. in Netflix, but it's a, it's, they try and squeeze it out completely. So there is an extended realm there that is, that my read of it is that it's still the divine being in there. I mean, Ted Bundy still has a soul, but it's just being so clouded and distorted and compromised by this other energy. However, we're to understand that I'm not saying I understand any of that stuff, but that seems to be consistently what what's being reported is that. So I, now, now maybe it makes sense to say, you know, Bill Gates. Yeah. I mean, there's some darkness there that we can't quite figure out, but I think we have to approach it from the standpoint of, well, we don't understand the darkness. We don't understand why he's uh, uh, doing what he does rather than get all indignant on the, in the fact that he's doing it. It's like what you said, uh, you know, you said it in a different way earlier in that you said, Hey, we don't know what this is going to bring. You know, we just have to be open to, you know, a, a larger uh, plan or just a larger ride on the, <laughs> in the river that we can't really control. Does any of that resonate with you? Yeah, yeah. And you made me think of James Holmes in the Aurora shooting, like he had a very similar uh, story of not knowing what had taken over him. And uh, that came from his cellmate. Of course, we didn't get any of the story from Epstein's cellmate since he died of COVID. But um, <laughs> yeah, or like the officer who was in charge of uh, security at, at the Capitol. 
<laughs> right, right. Committed suicide, right? We'll never get to those answers. Um, but yeah, uh, yes, uh, there's a lot of thought in that. And there's a lot of to do with magic and egregores and thought forms that are able to take over. If you consider Freemasonry and that, uh, you know, since at least 1700s, or you can go back to even the 1100s if you wish to go all the way back to the Templar and everything and their rituals. Uh, these uh, same exact rituals are performed over and over and over and over again in every lodge across the planet. And these same old men getting up on their altars and swearing to the light and doing their rituals of death and resurrection uh, has to be in putting an egregor or a thought form magic into them that then can you know, start to rise inside of them. And I even think this about my dad and his silence, uh, that there was something else that was in there that had been placed in there. And then if you add that to trauma-based mind control, another layer where you're physically uh, inserting this entity or evil into the being, then you've got a whole nother level. That's when you get to like James Holmes and, and, and the others that have crossed over to the dark side uh, but yeah the idea of of these rituals that are constantly performed in the exact same fashion they have to make sure they're always exactly the same i have a friend who's a mason that it's his job to go make sure each of the temples are actually doing it in the exact same fashion and for thousands of years men have said these words and cast these spells and and said these things and it's got to have some sort of thought form magic a gregor type of uh, you know, entity attached to it. Yeah, and then you go over to the Buddhists and they go, oh yeah, that's a tulpa, you know. And a tulpa, yeah, exactly. Different name for the same thing. And exactly. When you have cultures so divided that kind of come to the same conclusion. And then you have, you know, all that evidence that we have kind of modern day evidence of uh, stuff that, you know, people think they're channeling an entity and the entity is giving real information and then poof, you know, there's nothing there historically, you know, all that things. Hey, we ought to, uh, this has been awesome, man. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was, this is a reverse, in, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to do the intro now at the end. <laughs> You're going to have to do the intro at the end. That'll be great because we'll have to do this We'll have to do this again. I absolutely am like so totally into your show now. And it's like, I, I feel like a gift, you know, when you find a new show like this for me and you go, oh my God, there's all this content out there. I can look, go pick and choose and hear all this great stuff. So sorry, I didn't know all this fantastic stuff that was out there. And I just, I just kind of knew you as this figure i didn't know the content so i'm super excited to go dig into more of these interviews yeah and i'm used to it <laughs> um i would highly recommend going to my youtube page to start instead of freemantv.com i used to have all the videos on the website but it was causing issues but um if you go to the youtube channel freeman tv then use the playlists and so start with the TV show because that's my very first presentation and you can follow through the TV shows and then go through my lectures. Now, the reason you have to use the playlists is because I'm not allowed to put my own videos on YouTube. So I have to take them from other people that have uploaded them and put them into playlist because I, they're not allowed on my channel, like aliens from hell. I highly recommend it. Aliens from hell, write that down. Aliens from hell. It's my epic, it's my magnum opus. It was my final hurrah to the world. I haven't done a lecture since. Uh, well, actually I did, I did one more, but uh, that was my, my magnum opus right there. And I'm not allowed to put it on YouTube. So uh, other people are. And I also say, take all my videos, download them and upload them to your channel because I want them out there. But uh, Aliens from Hell is only in the playlist because I can't have it on my actual channel. And then for you specifically, Alex, uh, Jerry Marzinski is somebody, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cause we've had him on a couple of times, maybe even three times and, oh, wow. What's what amazing stories. Yes. Um, and you know, the, 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 did you get to the point in Marzinski with the guy who's directed to go to a field? Yeah. <laughs> Tell people, tell people. I'm that. trying to remember. 
Sorry. He's, he's you remind he, me. He like uh he's a convict. He's on the run from the either the police or, you know, it's it's I can't remember the details of how it starts. He either breaks out of prison or he's on the run, you know, there's like the lights in the background and stuff like that. So he hides and the voice because Marzinski's whole point is that he works as a forensic psychologist in uh, Arizona uh, prison system for like 20 years. And so he's dealing with all these people coming, I'm hearing voices. Okay, you're schizophrenic and here's what you do. No, I'm really hearing voices, voices, you know? So at some point he wakes up and he goes, wow, what if these people really are hearing voices? So he goes next level and starts hearing these stories. And this one guy, the one that I'm telling you the story I thought was incredible. He, th this guy goes, okay, so like he's, he's a convict, an escape convict. He's running from the police. He doesn't know where he's going. He's directed by the voice to go to a particular field and then like turn right, go a mile, then go into this cornfield. Right. And then right there is cocaine. Not like a little bit of cocaine, like a freaking you know, bushel, fall from the sky, narco kind of thing, cocaine. So, I mean, how do you process that? What, you know, we're talking yeah. about, you know, demons or some other entity or some, you know, directs this guy to go right where, and, you know, that doesn't exactly work out super well for him either, you know, I mean, if, so, right? Isn't that, isn't that kind of how you remember the story? Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. yes. I could remember the finale, and yeah, yeah, exactly. And the, the fact that he was brave enough to actually start and talking with these people and then he started hearing things and heard the lightning type crackle, electric crackle right, in the office. Right, and, right. good point. Uh, yeah, and, and the stories all combined, like separate people telling the same things. And, right. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Uh, it's amazing that more, you know, scientists, but of course in scientism, you're, not, you're ousted, right? It's not amazing. It's not amazing. See, that's, that's my point. And we'll, we'll talk about this, but it took me the longest time to realize that, fuck, man, that's part of the deal that, you know, if you were going to control people, uh, you know, from a scientific standpoint, what would you want them to believe? That they are uh, limitless beings with a consciousness that survives death and goes through many lives and is kind of this infinite consciousness? Or B, you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe, forget about it, you know, uh, Black Friday shopping, credit card, that's it. You know, you have nothing, you are meaningless. Well, you want B is a lot easier to manage those people than manage the first group. So science is in the business of telling you you're, you know, you're meaningless. You, there's nothing to consciousness. It's an illusion. I mean, that's just such a laughable proposition, but. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're cutting all of that off. Like I have always recommended the Celestine prophecies as a guidebook to how to in, in, uh, evoke miracles in your life dude and, dude but don't yeah. you have to add that to the list in a way of i mean that blows up i think and, and have you heard that i mean there's some stuff in there as well that is a little bit I, mean, I don't know i don't know that's another one to put in the zeitgeist category and at least explore you know where that takes you right yeah. Uh, well, you see, I was living it. And then the book came out and, uh, uh -huh. and people had always asked me, you know, how do you survive? How do you eat? How, where do you sleep? And I was always like, I don't know. Uh, you know, you just spent a year on the road. How? And I, was, I never had an answer. I'm like, I don't know. Everything just kept working out just exactly as it should. And, and I don't I can't explain it. But yet everything was perfect, better than I could have planned. And then the Celestine prophecies came out and I read it and I said, here, this is what I'm doing. This right. actually explains right. what I'm doing. Right. Now I, I, I get that. And, and it's like all, it's like the whole co-op story is always the same story, right? It's like, there's this core truth that is like profound. And then somebody says, Ooh, 
let's see if we can get in there and maybe tweak it, nudge it, yeah. you know, do, do it this way. Cause the secret's the same way, right? The well, secret, the secret like, yeah. You know, is, is kind of the same way. And then uh, even, uh, oh, uh, Carlos Castaneda, right? It's right. like incredible, incredible. I mean, like I remember first reading that it was like, for so many people, it was an, an awakening, you know, you wanted to be, you wanted to go find Don Juan and all that, but then go dig into that, you know, and did he really write that? And where is he in these New York cocktail parties and stuff like that? The co-opting thing is always, always the same. You know, it's like the example I always use is the Gloria Steinem, you know, the whole Gloria Steinem thing, right? No. CIA, right? No, I'm not up on that one. Okay. I mean, you can hear it in her own words, you know, she's CIA. She was CIA and she was CIA before they even plugged her into the women's movement. She was CIA doing these uh, student protest things. And we even have, you know, memos from the CIA where they go, wow, this gal, she is a go getter, man. Let me tell you, you know, this is this is like out there, out there revealed, like you can read this stuff. Well, it, it, you know who she was outed by? Um, people listen to the show get tired of me saying this. She was outed by a feminist, by a feminist group that was like, what the fuck are you saying, lady? This is like faux feminism you're putting out there. This is like a distorted message. Well, it's a distorted message because it was the CIA's version of how they wanted that thing to, to go. Yeah. Yeah. If things are rising to the surface, if you're, and you know, the first, first, uh premise of, of magic is if you want to control something name it and so QAnon and and yeah. anything that's being promoted anything that is rising to the surface is part of the scheme you know once you start to realize that and then little guys like me and the freeman perspective and freeman tv uh you've never heard of us you know, never heard of me right you know and i've been uh, a key factor in all of the things that you have known and you don't know that like, you know, that these conversations started with me. Now that's a, that is a pretty interesting point right there that, again, it's another aspect of the co-opting, I'd say, you know, so yeah. one part of the co-opting is get in there and tweak it. And another part of the co-opting, which we see over and over again, is just uh, kind of confiscate it and then just put it out in our own channel, you know? Just go grab it, take it, <laughs> and just put it out in our own channel so we control it. So the one is you go and you 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 kind of buy off Freeman or you catch him doing something he isn't supposed to do, or you, you know, Timothy Leary, you know, who was FBI under under uh under threat of jail for like you know 20 years. Well, you know, I mean, he was a free man, but how free was he really? So that's, but if they don't do that to you, the other thing they do with you is they go, oh, well, no one's really, he isn't penetrating on a really broad sense. So let's just go grab it and we'll just take what we want, repurpose it. And don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Just, yeah, shadow ban me and, and yeah, yeah. promote everything else. And, 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 yeah. and, but let it, let it come out a different way, you know, mm. when you're ready, you know. Like I say, they turn my science into a mythology. You know, everybody talking about Illuminati logos. This isn't Illuminati. And it's so frustrating for me to yeah. know the science and have everybody misuse terms and have a mythology created out of science. Uh, you know, my particular science anyway. And and they just mythologized it. They, they just turned it into this. You're not, if you go hunting the Illuminati, you're never going to find them. <laughs> it doesn't exist. But yet that term, I had to literally go change the titles of my films because everybody was Googling Illuminati, not Freemason. And so, you know, I literally had to change terms that I was using because I never said that they were forms of magic that were controlling your mind. You know, the corporate logos and such, they were signs of allegiance so that Freemasons can recognize another Freemason. If they see a canted square, they know that that person's been through the third degree. Uh, you know, uh, Shell and the, the star, uh, these are all Masonic logos, Masonic symbols. And so as I studied Masonic ritual, as I drove around, all of a sudden these corporate logos were speaking a new language to me. 
and I was recognizing all of the Masonic meanings of target of shell of Texaco and uh, you know, so it became, you know, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. These all adhere to Freemasonry. So when I put out corporate logos, I, I, I identified them as signs of allegiance for Freemasons. And then it became this Illuminati logo that have magic spells and are taking over your soul. And it became this thing that just wasn't true. Mind blown again. I knew all that, but you just put it with a little twist that totally blows my mind again. Freeman, you're unbelievable. Nice. <laughs> I don't even know that I'm doing it. <laughs> you know, that's the big difference here, too, is I've just lived through all this, right? This hasn't been yes. internet research. This was, you know, when I started, it was books. I had to go to the library. I have a massive library. I have a massive library. Uh, I have all the occult books. I have all the magical orders practices. I have dark magic, white magic. I have every book on Freemasonry. I have every, you know, I, I have it all. I have a massive library and I read, right? And I take it all in and then I experience it like Y2K, you know, that was an experience, not a, not a research that, you know, and when I started my television show, if you notice, I don't have any notes. Uh, I'm just going off of what I remember. And, and, you know, it's different because I lived through it instead of uh, researched it. No, that's, uh, that's, that's really, you, you, I, I'm stumbling here because what I immediately think of is in a way that's the real magical spell today is that now everyone's living through it you know i mean when when we lived through 911 we weren't totally aware that we were living through it i would suggest that what we're living through now a lot a lot of people are aware that they're living through it i mean you talk to a lot of people and they go even older people, and they go, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And yeah. that living through it, lived experience is a, is a different kind of thing than to, uh, to, to wonder, you know, is it a conspiracy? Is there something else going on? To live it as it gets unveiled day by day, it's different, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you're not an armchair quarterback. You're actually in the mix of it all. And you know, it, it, consider my 9-11, like when people ask me, well, you know, what, where were you on 9-11? I was being woken up by a horde of people that were pissed off because I had told them it was going to happen. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> like, like, that's how <laughs> like I woke up. Like you made it happen or something. Yeah, yeah. I could not understand their reaction. Like I'm, I'm just waking up. I didn't even know it was 9-11 that day. Like I, I was at a party the weekend before. I've been talking about it for three years throughout the whole Clinton era. Hold on, no, 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 wait. Okay, so we're gonna stop right there. Okay. <laughs> we are gonna do another we'll one of these. Another. All right. We're gonna start, cause you have great stories. And I'm sure you've told the story a million times. I don't care. I wanna hear it. And then I wanna rebroadcast it to other people. Um, but I, I, that, that has to be the opening story. I love okay. that cinemagraphic, right? You're in your bed. Everyone knows where they are in 9-11, and you don't even know it's 9-11 until people wake you up and say, you freaking magician, you, you, magician, you somehow caused that. That has to be how we start <laughs> our, next little, uh, our next little dialogue. Okay. All right. We'll put a feather in that one for sure. All right. Well, you know, we probably should wrap this one up. We've been going well over two hours now. Uh, you're going to have to send me the recording so I can put it out on my line because I never hit record. <laughs> a absolutely. No, it's, it's been, it's been just, just been great. You know, and in your little email, you said, I think we're going to become friends, man. Yeah. I think we are going to become friends. This is, it, it's so awesome, man. I just so respect what you're doing. And it's just been uh, like I told, told you a couple of times I, I'm learning going through your, <laughs> Whenever I, I, I listen to somebody like you and I'm learning so much, there's kind of this excitement at learning a bunch of new stuff. 
And there's also this kind of humility. I just feel like such a dunce, like, how did I not know this? How did I not know this? But I like that feeling. I like that, you know, that being humbled a little bit in terms of what we know and what we think we know. So I, I, I thank you for that uh, as part of this whole process. Hell yeah. And yeah, we'll, we're, we're going to do this on your show and on my show again. And because uh, uh, I still want to interview you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. But uh, uh, but this has been great. Freeman Fly, everybody. Uh, you know, it's it's just Freeman dot T. Freeman TV dot com. Freeman TV dot com. But you're really saying we need to check out the YouTube channel. And what's the best way to search for the YouTube channel? Freeman Fly. So just Freeman uh, Fly, two words or one yeah, word? Way. Yeah, because somebody stole my title. So somebody has another YouTube channel called Freeman TV, which okay. uploads all of my videos, okay. which I don't mind. I like having a mirrored, you know, I, I have no problem with it. I don't know who it is. I have no idea who it is. But somebody has mirrored my, my YouTube channel and made their own and taken my title, Freeman TV, so you might end up finding that one first, but if you search Freeman Fly, then my YouTube comes up first. So your YouTube, and that has the playlists that connect to some of these early uh, access cable shit crap craziness, man. That's like, yeah. gee, you're going back yeah. in time in such a yeah. cool way. Same way that- People are always like, you know, would, did you do this on VHS? And I'm like, well, actually, yeah. <laughs> like there wasn't, this was back then, you guys, you know, yes, it was VHS to VHS. That uh, isn't yeah. a rumor, that isn't a conspiracy. It really existed. <laughs> there were these yeah. tapes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it's old, it's crazy, you know. I, I, I like, I literally had to drive around and take pictures of corporate logos. Right. Like, that's how old this is. Like, there was no Google pictures. You couldn't go just drag and drop. Like, you know, I had to drive around and take photographs of all the corporate logos I wanted to talk about. Uh, it took me forever to find a Texaco in Texas. It was like, I couldn't believe it. They didn't seem to exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, but and yeah. Shell, so Shell is the classic one. But, you know, I'm going to go see, like, that's another area where. I kind of knew that stuff like a long time ago, but I just, there's so much, it just kind of, you know, just kind of glossed over, just kind of lost it. And like you just said a while back, and then I really am going to wrap this up, but it's like, this is what I love about your work. And as soon as I got into it, I noticed this and it's just so powerful is you have this little way of tweaking something that kind of gives it a whole new meaning. So when you said sign of allegiance, it's like, bam, it all now clicks into place because it didn't make sense as a kind of ritualized magic, you know, you're under a spell kind of thing. Sign of allegiance. It's a sign, man. We're going to put it everywhere. We're going to get that logo. We're going to let I you know. I could have told you uh, years ago, Starbucks was going to be popular. Well, I knew the thing about Starbucks, but I didn't know it at sea. Exactly. I, I, I knew the thing about Starbucks when it first came out, but I didn't understand it as a, that's a key phrase, man. Sign of allegiance is like, is, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I'm making too big of a deal out of it. It just, no, no, that's for me. the key ingredient. That's the key ingredient. And that's what really frustrates me. So I'm very happy that you're picking up on that because as soon as it became this foofy magic stuff, I was like, Oh, you guys lost the point, you know? Right. Right. Okay, everybody, first of, I hope many of these, Freeman Fly has been, been our guest, told you how to get to his stuff. Please do check it out, you know, and then we're going to do this again. So Freeman, bro, awesome. Thank you so much. Well, let me do my introduction and then we will uh, wrap this one up and, and I'll put this out on my, on my feed.